Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. This week is, if you are in the United States, Thanksgiving. It is time to gather with friends and relatives and eat massive amounts of food. It is also generally time to travel long distances. And what do all of these things have in common? Well, unless you're the one doing the cooking or helping out with the cooking, this usually involves sitting on your butt, potentially bored. Now maybe maybe you might watch a football game or the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, but if inane parade commentary isn't your thing, if you're not a football fan, or if the teams that are playing aren't teams you're fans of, you need something else. You need something to keep you entertained, either as an audiobook on that long drive, or as just a book to sit down and read while you're staying carefully out of the kitchen and out from underfoot so you don't get killed by angry people with knives. And so, I bring you today's review. A, well, a science fiction novel, since I haven't done one of these in a while. One by John Scalzi, a writer who has basically become the smash hit ever since he wrote uh, Old Man's War, which I have not read yet, and I will review at some point in the future. And that book is Fuzzy Nation. Fuzzy Nation is a book that falls into a rare category when it comes to novels. The reboot or remake. The book is an adaptation of Little Fuzzy by H. Beam Piper. A book that has fallen into the public domain and which I'll be putting a link to uh, on Project Gutenberg in the show notes. The book follows Jack Holloway, a prospector on the planet Zarathustra 23, working under contract for Zeracorp a company with the exclusive contract to handle the exploitation of the planet, provided that the planet doesn't have any intelligent life on it. Holloway is a former attorney who was disbarred after his conscience overwhelmed his ethical detachment, causing him to punch his client in the face while in court. Oh, and Jack has a dog named Carl of an indeterminate breed who Jack has trained to set off explosives, which is awesome. Jack and Carl find a massive vein of sunstones, Precious gems with great monetary value, but not much scientific or industrial value, like rubies or emeralds, on their claim, putting them in a good bargaining position with Zeracorp. Jack also discovers, as a consequence of his blasting, a group of small fuzzy creatures which he creatively names fuzzies. Said creatures are fortunately pictured on the cover, which also, sadly, prevents me from hunting down pictures of gremlins, critters, and Ewoks to use when I talk about them. So, Jack ends up finding himself bargaining with Zeracorp to make sure they don't screw him over, while also trying to find out whether the fuzzies are sentient. To help Jack with this, he contacts his ex-girlfriend Isabel, a biologist stationed on Zarathustra to study the indigenous life, and Isabel's boyfriend, Mike Sullivan, the associate general counsel for the planet, and quite possibly the coolest lawyer since Perry Mason. From here, the story becomes something of a hard-boiled detective novel, except instead of investigating a criminal case, a kidnapping, blackmail, or murder, instead it's a scientific investigation, the determination over the sentience of the fuzzies. Similarly, like with the Philip Marlowe or Peter Gunn case, there are forces trying to get Jack to give up his investigation, and in this case, also this value of some of the claim. We have Wheaton Aubrey the the seventh, the person in charge of Zeracorp's exploitation of Zarathustra 23, who is applying the soft pressure. He's kind of like the gangster who's trying to pay off the detective and get him to drop the case. And on the other side of the coin is Joe DeLise, who is the head of security, and he's your big goon who, when the soft pressure, when the bribery doesn't work, who comes in and gives the hard pressure, the threats of violence, that if you don't drop the case, Marlo, I'll break your face, or that sort of thing. In the story's third act, the book slips from the hard-boiled detective form formula and into a courtroom drama, with the fate of the fuzzies lying in the balance. Now, courtroom dramas can, depending on how much the writer 
wants to stick with actual legal procedure, stop the story stone dead. TV shows like Perry Mason and Law and & Order realize this in their writing and adjusted to it by either fudging courtroom procedure to make the story more TV friendly, or by using time skips during the trial to go right to the interesting parts, res respectively. Scalzi, on the other hand, realizes, hey, we're in the future, we are on another planet, we are dealing with whole other issues beyond what your standard courtroom procedure is meant to handle, and thus adjusts the rules and plays with them as he sees fit to reflect the situation, and also in return keeping things interesting and allowing the pace to move properly for, to make for an interesting book. Consequently, the end result is a courtroom sequence that is less Matlock and more Phoenix Wright in all the right ways. No pun intended. You know, actually, this book has basically inspired me to put forward another fan work challenge. Mind you, the last fan work challenge I did didn't pan out at all, but I'll give it a try again. For those of you who have skill in flash animation and pixel art and all that sort of thing, I would like to see some fan work of the courtroom scene from Fuzzy Nation done uh, in the Phoenix Wright style, because I think that would fit in well with the book. Further, John Scalzi, if you are watching this, please contact me because I would like to do a prize for this contest. I have a few ideas for what it would be, and I want to save them on the podcast until I've actually set them up and confirmed them so I'm not setting false expectations. As it stands, unless a better prize idea comes along, um, in terms of if I get in touch with Scalzi and we set something up, the prize I will put forward is I will review one book, video game, or film of the winner's choice within reason. It has to be something I can get a hold of. Um, it has to be something that is yeah, basically it's something that is accessible. It's something which I don't find explicitly offensive. I'm not going to review the Turner Diaries. I'm not going to review Batman Holy Terror or whatever, that, if Holy Terror, the new Frank Miller book. I'm not going to review that. There's a bit within reason I have reserved the right to veto your pick and ask you for something else. Um, but we'll figure something out. So, anyway, oh, if it is a video game, I'll probably also do a Let's Play of it as well. So consider keep that in mind also. So, anyway, as far as the book itself goes, Fuzzy Nation is a really nice hybrid of old school and new school science fiction. Not just because it is an adaptation and reboot of an older work. Fuzzy Nation kind of works pretty well with that old school idea of we're going to take a concept. Um, in this case, the process of determining sen sentience for a race and running with it. Um, and tell an interesting and exciting story based around that idea. Um, but it puts modern sensibilities in there. It keeps in mind things that have happened over the past almost over 50 years since Fuzzy Nation, the original book, came out. It, it, it also has modern attitudes. I mean, I have not read the original um, Little Fuzzy, but I'm pretty sure H.P. and Piper probably wouldn't have somebody giving someone else the finger. Or there wouldn't be but not much profanity or anything like that. It'd be probably hard to get away with that in most um, books of that period, I suspect, depending on when it came out. Um, but it works great. This book is excellent. I wholeheartedly recommend it. Also, if you're looking for an audiobook for the, a long train ride, car ride, or whatever, um, using the example I mentioned earlier, well... The audiobook is unabridged and read by Will Wheaton. So that's a whole big chunk of awesomeness right there, too. Um, which makes it the perfect listening for when you're going over the river and through the woods. Oh, and but like I mentioned profanity. The profanity is very... It, it's minor. It's more than you'd see in a book from the 40s. But it's about you know, PG, PG-13. So it's, it's safe to have in the playing on the car stereo with the kitties in the car. So anyway, with that broke review done, 
it's time once again to be Chrono Gaming with Power, as the Nintendo Power Retrospective rolls on with Part 4, covering Issue 4 of Nintendo Fun Club News. I hope you look forward to that, and I will see you next time.